post lunch stupor uh, and settle in for some uh, exciting, we hope, uh, news here. Uh, my name is John Board. Um, my mix of titles will become relevant to the uh, conversation we have here today. Um, for the last 14 weeks, I've been lecturing at exactly this time to 185 students in my role as a faculty member, so I am probably going to pace with the microphone rather than stay foot at the podium and treat you as my class. You also have the advantage that I'm totally blinded to the audience by the lighting we have here, so you can mock me, make faces, and the like. So the three of us here from Duke are eager to talk about a two-year process that we've been going through to understand how to better support our faculty and our students in their research and learning missions, especially in their research missions with this. And so I'm joined by Tim McGeary from our libraries and Rebecca Brower from our research office, and they'll introduce themselves more formally uh, when we get to them. Um, so the overview of this is going to, we're going to take you through this two-year-long uh, four-phase process that we did to try to be uh, very thorough in determining what faculty actually need to help do their research. Before I start that, I think it'd be, it was, it's useful to give a little bit of historical anecdotes of, of how Duke has gotten to where it is in the space of supporting faculty in research computing in particular. Um, uh, I've been at Duke for 45 years, starting as a freshman, and for 44 of those years, I've been running research computing support for my, my uh, uh, faculty and student colleagues, because back in 1979, it seemed a really good idea to, when the department got its first large-scale you know, mini-computer, um, we could have paid a grown-up to run it, but hey, there's this snivelly sophomore nerd who seems really obsessed with computers. He'd probably do it for free. Um, let's get him to do it and give him the root password and run everything. So that is how we started. I, so I ran all computing in the School of Engineering when I was an undergraduate. Um, I wrote the damn email system. That's how you get no numbers after your net ID, is be the one who writes the email system. Um, but uh, the very fact that engineering kind of cowboyed this, this system uh, and got it donated externally and I kind of only told the administration after the fact that we'd arranged the donation was kind of characteristic of the way computing had to be done at Duke in that era, 45 years ago. And I did go away and get my doctorate and come back a few years later on the faculty in 87. Um, and computing at Duke was terrible. None, no one in the senior administration thought it was important. We belong to an entity called the Triangle University Computation Center with our friends from UNC Chapel Hill and NC State, as well as some smaller institutions that used one mainframe computer for all the teaching and all the research needs of all three of these tiny little campuses that we have. And for Duke's administration, that was check, computing is taken care of. Uh, with the rise of, so, so my, the, my arrival at Duke in the fall of 87 coincid was coincidental with two significant event, uh, events in the history of computing. Uh, the July-August issue of the Bell System Tech Journal is where uh, Bell Labs uh, released Unix to the world, uh, which made possible for the first time uh, the creation of, of computing systems that were independent of the details of the hardware that they operated on. And uh, Intel had, in had introduced this god-awful, ugly, worst piece of computer architecture ever designed in the history of man, the 8086 chip, which, of course, has come, on, has come along to co totally dominate all computing and made possible this whole world of standardized computing building blocks on which all of us now build our systems. I'm just old enough I was the last class at Duke to do programming on punch cards. So yes, part of my digital archives are still many, many boxes of punch cards. We get to the early 80s, and um, these Unix workstations are starting to come out, and the faculty filed a report every year saying the, uni the university was negligent in not doing more in this space, and those reports were dutifully filed in the circular file every year. Um, but they did, uh, they, they, to try to shut the faculty up, um, if the basketball team happened to do well in the tournament, and we got TV money, and this is due, so we did get this money kind of often. Um, that's the, that was the, uh, the, the firm budget foundation on which academic computing was run at Duke. The only administrator who cared about computing was a university librarian, so it was the librarian who oversaw all this. Um, and then my very first committee assignment at Duke was convincing them to build one of these network thingies um, uh, that, uh, that might not ruin the university if we built it. 
Um, so years of tragedy continue until about 25 years ago, and there is uh, the, the kind of crisis moment that you seize upon to change things. Uh, and uh, after uh, a, a, a bit of a faculty riot, I think it's fair to say, and a change in leadership, uh, we finally founded a central IT organization to start organizing uh, services. My role in all this was a whiner, uh, a bit that we weren't moving fast enough, and so about 20, uh, almost 20 years ago, I was co-opted as the associate CIO for Duke to be the voice of faculty inside the IT organization, at least, to try to make sure we were moving in the right direction to meet faculty needs for research and for teaching. Um, so uh, over the past 20 years, we, uh, I, I've had the privilege of writing all the IT strategic plans, co-authoring them over, over the last few years. We've had about one a decade. Uh, and the first one really irritated people when we, when we seized on the mantra, third to none, right? That that was Duke's aspiration, was to be in the position, I can see, about the, yeah, that, that would go over real well today, wouldn't it, right? Um, but our aspiration was to be in a position to be early followers of what the real schools who were serious about research support and computing support could do. Uh, we've gotten better. <laughs> and part of that getting better um, is listening carefully to the faculty, uh, having the faculty give the university good advice about all its IT investments, not just its academic IT investments. That was one of the um, critical things uh, that has fed into this process, is that we've created an IT governance structure at Duke, uh, which is quite remarkable. In the 25 years that we've had a central IT organization, we've only had two CIOs, and we've had Tracy Fufi now for almost 20 of those 25 years that we've had a, uh, a CIO. And she is sufficiently good as her, at her job, acceptable, as the, as the Vulcans would say, that I'm, worth, I'm willing to do t you know, two full-time jobs to be able to work with her on, on doing these things. Um, and so uh, t about two years ago, uh, um, in the meantime, I also have oversight over research computing at Duke at this point. Um, and we were discussing that it would be, we know that our research computing support is too high performance computing centric, because that's where it grew out of. We're very good at that. There's a subset of our faculty who do need those services and with whom we've partnered very well. But everyone else on campus in all departments, uh, there are faculty doing intensive computational things, and we did not think that the collection of infrastructure we had in central IT was fully meeting their needs, and we knew we needed to expand to have better resources in the digital humanities and the social sciences. We needed better and easier to use protected networks in which research on sensitive data could happen. So Tracy uh, began organizing a very thorough review of how um, IT, OIT initially, our central IT unit, uh, could better support research computing needs of faculty all across the institution. Um, so how do we support the non-HPC crowd? Uh, there are lots of them, um, uh, especially the social scientists and humanities faculty who generally have the, the, you know, the, the added excitement that they have no money. I mean, as has been said at some of the sessions, I've crashed today. Um, you know, the engineering faculty, the, the STEM faculty usually have money to buy more or less what they need and have the, grant, the grantsmanship opportunities to get the money if they need it. But when I started working with our Social Science Research Institute, uh, before it went through some renamings, uh, we were like, oh, the, the, the boundary condition is there's no money. But I'm a PhD student, and if I'm going to graduate, I have to do this study anyway, so please make that happen. Uh, that's a very different world from <coughs> for those of us who are used to supporting STEM faculty. Um, on top of this, um, no news to anyone in this room that there are one or two more regulations now around the use of data than there have been in the past. Our vice president for research was addressing our equivalent of the faculty senate last Thursday and showed a graph uh, plotting the cumulative number of federal regulations and policies affecting research, starting from zero in around 1993, and it's almost a linear plot up to 250 today. Uh, and, you know, she was being very transparent with the faculty that this is why you're feeling a lot of pain, and we know you're mad at us because you want us to make it all just go away, and part of our goal is to see how much of it we can make go away knowing that, uh, nonetheless, it is real. 
Um, managing storage is hard. Um, we have not one, but several storage options at Duke. It depends on the type of data you're using. It depends on, on um, the classification of that data. And we have the added um, excitement that we do have an academic medical center. And any of you from institutions with an academic medical center know that, and, and an associated gigantic hospital network. Uh, but their IT world is very different from our IT world. Uh, at Duke, they have uh, separate CIOs, uh, com uh, separate organizations. We do have shared services across the whole campus. Our network is now more or less the common network. Some of our storage uh, systems are common, uh, but it's still very much one country, two systems. And the faculty who really get stuck in the middle of that tend to be the basic sciences uh, faculty in the School of Medicine whose work has nothing to do with human PHI, but since they fall on the wrong side of the fence, uh, they are required to act as if all their research was on human PHI, and that is a problem. So um, as one of the reasons we still like having Tracy around is her first instinct is let's go to the faculty and see what the faculty think about all this. And she did not just talk to one or two. Uh, this is where the IT governance that we have at Duke is relevant. As part of creating the central IT unit uh, 20, um, 25 years ago, the faculty insisted there be a single IT governance group that talked about all types of IT investments at Duke, not just the, um, uh, the, the research and teaching investments, but also the administrative systems that we want all these systems, because we have experts in the business school, in the law school, in public policy school who can, who can guide the university, even on something as mundane as the HR payroll system. Um, and because Duke had made some tragically bad investments in that space uh, in, in, in prior decades. So we have this, this group meets 90 minutes every two weeks, all year long, including in the summer, although we do drop maybe half the summer meetings. And the faculty consistently say it's their favorite committee at Duke and can they be reappointed, please? How many of you have an advisory committee like that? Um, the way you get an advisory committee like that is to listen to them for 25 years and either do what they say or explain carefully why you understand what they are asking for but why we have to do something different for this and this and this. And when they recognize that what they say matters, and, and they was me for a long time because I was a member of this for, for many years before I became evil and flipped hats and became a and a, a, a ter an administrator uh, 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 instead of a, of a pure faculty member. Um, but we have this group. Uh, it has 15 faculty who come. We also have undergraduate and graduate students who are full members of the committee as well, as well as IT staff. We have a very distributed IT structure at Duke. Our central IT is 350 people or so, but, but overall, just on the campus side, there are about 1,000 IT people. Tim has a bunch in his shop. There are IT people in Rebecca's shop. Um, every school still has some local IT. Um, most business units have some local IT. So IT is a big coordinated uh, mess at Duke. Um, but the 15 faculty uh, just on our advisory council, she did not think were sufficient to speak for the full faculty. So she has the uh, clout on campus to be able to ask and get yeses from 50 other faculty to come participate in a series of seven working groups to talk through in detail the, the emerging IT support needs uh, for research that we were seeing all across uh, the university. So we created the, this four-phase process that we've been going through. Um, and phase one is what I'll be, uh, uh, I will conclude talking about here in just a few minutes. This is uh, the airing of the grievances, right? This is where we get the, uh, the, about the, the 65 or so faculty participating in this, in this endeavor. And you know how hard it is to make faculty talk about what irritates them, right? <laughs> um, uh, so many notes were taken, right? Um, uh, but what's critical about the process is that we didn't stop there. Just collecting a list of things faculty are pissed about doesn't move the university forward. What is critical uh, are what has happened subsequently in phases two, phase three, and phase four. And just to jump to the end, we're at the happy position now that we are actively writing job descriptions for many new people uh, and, and, and new services uh, of, as the result of the thoroughness of this study. But we will get to that when we get to it. 
So phase one, we had the listening sessions with seven groups of faculty, uh, natural sciences, social sciences, basic sciences, engineering, and then our friends in the humanities made it very clear to us that there couldn't be one group representing the humanities. We needed three separate groups to understand the complexity of computational needs in the humanities, to which we said, great, thank you very much. Tell us who they are. We will talk to all of them. So all seven of these groups uh, met a number of times and gathered and, and went through a, a semi-structured process to get faculty to talk about what was really holding them up in their research when it came to data and computing as broadly defined as we could make it. Um, each of these groups then consumed one week um, uh, or, or one, one full session of our uh, advisory meeting group, airing what they found with the, the larger IT advisory committee. Um, and you know, how many dozens of entries were there of things that the faculty had explicitly complained about? Many, many dozens of post-it notes were put up on whiteboards in a couple of poster sessions that we organized and filed and filtered and tried to coalesce into some themes. And we were able to reduce, uh, after many months of work, uh, into with this very simple looking chart. Uh, but this uh, captures 10 things that were very important to the faculty. And the surprise uh, to, um, to Tracy, I think, in particular, was how much it was not about what, oh, what central IT can do anything about. That when you actually ask the faculty to start complaining about what holds up their research, it was all about where's the subject matter expertise to help me understand in my field how to accomplish, uh, navigate the storage systems, navigate the data use agreements, navigate all this cruft that, that is in my way of just doing the science that I want to, to do. Um, and um, so uh, we, we would be calling it the research IT needs assessment process. And then several, and, and the slide decks coming out of that, um, Tracy made it very clear to put a red X for, through IT. It, and it became very much the research needs assessment process of which IT was a component. The three boxes on the bottom are the ones where, you know, all IT were kind of where we were thinking things would go. Um, of course, faculty want some additional HPC uh, resources. We have an entitlement level for computing on campus, and they want that entitlement bigger, and they want it spread to PhD students. Those are things we're going to be able to accomplish. Uh, uh, shocking, they want more GPUs on campus. We kind of knew that, but we were able to quantify that uh, through this process as well. Um, they, uh, uh, and, and with, the, with everyone in every discipline thinking about machine learning, uh, many of, uh, in many of these disciplines, don't have the expertise to really tune the models well themselves. You know, a large outcry for help building very specific pipelines in the, in the data analytics and machine learning spaces. So five, six, uh, seven, we have um, so many solutions, um, and yet no one has ever heard of any of them, you know, on the day that we tell them it exists. And, and so there is the... Uh, constant cry that, that we've heard for all 30 years I've been involved in IT uh, um, delivery uh, that can't we simplify our documentation and make it more clear what Duke offers. I'm sure the libraries never have this problem either of saying, of, of crystallizing for the faculty the services we have. And we will try to do better with the added complication that now some of those services are cloud services as well and yet we're still kind of responsible for brokering them to the campus community. Um, and then a special bullet on storage. Um, uh, uh, all of us have perfect models for storing all the data forever, uh, even though the grant's only funded for five years. Uh, I've heard that theme at this meeting. I hear it at every IT leader, uh, leadership meeting I go to. We are also making progress in how to build long-term storage options that are affordable, economic, uh, and meet you know, the specific requirements of NIH and all the other funding agencies, uh, as well as are easy for faculty to use. And we are fortunate enough in our IT organization uh, that we get lots of NSF grants. Uh, I saw a couple other people refer to CC Star programs in some of the sessions I've crashed today. We have, we have uh, had a lot of CC Star grants, um, uh, in, and some right now very much looking into a, a, a modern open source file system that integrates metadata as a first principles um, uh, 
uh, part of organizing the file system uh, with some tools for automatic migration of data from hot storage to warm storage to cold storage that we think is going to play a role in this. And faculty certainly it, you know, indicated these were needs. But I've skipped the most important boxes because this is where we were kind of surprised that by far the largest human outcry was number one. We need teams of domain-specific technical people uh, who can talk to someone in the social sciences, someone in the humanities, about how to map the problem they're trying to solve uh, to technologies that Duke has available. We didn't have a great answer for that at Duke. And, and this, was, this was by far the largest, uh, out human, you know, the largest outcry, the most consistently reported thing. It came from STEM faculty. It came from non-STEM faculty, but kind of especially from non-STEM faculty, I think. Um, and then kind of related to that is we have a lot of training programs that run at Duke to teach people, students, faculty, and staff about particular technologies outside the context of any particular course. How can we better organize and publicize those so people realize there's a lot of, of extra and co-curricular education already available on the campus to help students um, and, and faculty um, who are willing to admit they don't know everything. Uh, to take these courses and fill in these gaps themselves. Um, in B, uh, this kind of get, this is uh, Duke code for, we have the separate university and health system environments and faculty and who, especially faculty who fall in both camps, and that's a lot of faculty at Duke who have some type of joint appointment between the two, uh, the two entities. Um, how can we make their lives better? Uh, and that is one of the more difficult windmills to tilt at, but we have made some progress in this process. And then uh, uh, box C here uh, is uh, about the, um, the, our Duke's uh, security and compliance posture. You can Google Duke and NIH, and you can find that we got ourselves in trouble uh, uh, not too many years ago. Uh, the misdeeds of one can cost uh, the university uh, a lot. 400 million to start with in cash? Huh? 112. Uh, and then a big headache for um, all the faculty who are left who are now under do on double secret probation from all the funding agencies uh, to prove that, that the rest of the N minus one faculty at Duke aren't like the one. Uh, uh, there's more than one, two or three now. Um, so that's part of the problem. Uh, when you have enough faculty, you will have some who misbehave. Um, but since uh, by dollar volume, grants from the School of Medicine um, and, and the clinical side tend to dominate Duke, a lot of our research policies historically tried to treat all research at Duke as if it were on the core model of research in the health system and write rules that were intending to apply to all grants at Duke, which you give to a history faculty member writing an, you know, a National Endowment for the Humanities grant doesn't really make sense, and yet is ordering a whole bunch of thou shouts about, his, about the production of his book, I guess, that says it has to be done in secure storage in a controlled environment. So a lot of angst about uh, our one-size-fits-all approach to security and compliance. And so the faculty um, uh, were, were uh, very vocal <laughs> in, their, in their complaints. Uh, and we, as we put these together, those, those six high-level categories that we, we lumped the 10 things into, um, it's very clear they're not independent of each other. You know, almost all of these influence almost all the others. Um, uh, the, a, lot of, a lot of hours went into figuring out which arrows don't go into that slide. Uh, but, you know, basically it says everything depends on everything. So we can't solve these problems in isolation. So the most important thing that I think we probably did at that point was recognize this is not an IT problem. Uh, and thanks to having a relatively new university librarian, whom we like a lot, and a relatively new vice president for research at Duke, uh, they agreed wholly uh, with Tracy that this was a university-wide problem to solve uh, by uh, all three of these units working together. Um, and with that, I turn the story over to phase two. You're going to. So uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Tim McGarry. I'm the Associate University Librarian for Digital Strategies and Technology in the University Libraries at Duke. And I'm happy to talk about phase two and three of our, of our process. 
So as John uh, mentioned, the three co-sponsors, uh, Tracy Futhi, Joe Salem, and Jenny Lodge, um, identified leaders and service providers um, and faculty champions and stakeholders to take part of the six working groups that John described um, a couple slides earlier. So again, we collected another 55 um, individuals, um, some of whom were in the original group and some of whom I believe were new because we wanted to test the priorities um, that were identified by the faculty in the first phase with a, with a different set of faculty. And so we met uh, weekly for 10 weeks, and I, I, I will attest that is a, a major accomplishment in and of itself to get 55 individuals with a very short notice to commit to a 10-week weekly process. Um, I can also attest being a part of four of those groups how complicated that, that got. Um, so they identified um, 39 service, uh, potential services that could meet the needs that were in those six boxes um, and to address those. Um, and then they consolidated those priorities to 29, and then to 21, and they kept calling them down and trying to pull together um, overlaps between different groups. Um, and then we focused on surveying the faculty and estimating costs, and then we landed on the top 12 priorities, which will advance to phase three. So let me talk a little bit more about that process. So these slides will be available, so you don't have to try to read all of the text here, but here is a list of the 39 different service providers or proposals that came from each of the six working groups. Um, and we identified them in the, in the boxes um, as each groups because as, we, as you'll see in future slides, we regroup these um, priorities and proposals. And again, I'll also note this is where we X'd out the IT part of the top three boxes because it really wasn't just IT. It was really uh, research needs across, across the university. So we did another faculty survey, which we had about uh, 58 uh, faculty participate, and these were uh, individuals that were um, part of phase, phase one and two, um, and we had about a 67% response rate um, in those surveys, and you can see um, a little bit of how they grouped um, the, the priorities. Um, there was a focus on the domains that they came from and, this, and what was impactful for each of their contexts. Um, and the faculty did heed our request to spread out their scores across 21 services that we, did, we knew that they, we couldn't do with them all, and so we asked them to pick uh, what, you know, what were their highest priorities. Um, but even the lowest rated service overall was rated highest by some. So it wasn't as if we had a, a very clear picture of, well, these are the ones everybody agrees on. No, there were priorities that everybody, uh, at least some person uh, in the group felt like it was the most important priority. So we still had more work to do. So we took the 29 distinct um, services that we uh, whittled down to and we um, started focusing on what the cost estimates might be and we grouped these together. So the top three um, bubbles um, represent what was listed as um, having the highest um, strategic priority by the sponsors. So this would be Tracy and Joe and, and Jenny. Um, and then um, we decided um, from those pr um, perspectives that those would be the three groupings of priorities that we've been move on to phase three and identify funding for. There was another two priorities that we put on the, on the bubble, which we would um, put in a parking lot to evaluate further. Um, and then the other uh, five priorities that were down, the lower strategic priorities, um, were listed as ones that perhaps maybe are more school-based um, or maybe has some mixed overall reactions, and, and we, could, we could look at those later. Um, perhaps we need to do some local pilots or some, or some collaborations. You'll notice the purple bubble in the middle that says sponsor additional priorities. These are ones that the three co-sponsors identify specifically that were not ones that were in the faculty list, but had been deemed ones that the faculty would enjoy because they would take out some of the, uh, the work or some of the gaps that the faculty themselves may not have um, either visibility for or, or can't accomplish um, themselves. So then they, uh, the co-sponsors then went again and, uh, and mapped these uh, 29 distinct services again, um, not only by the groupings that they had in the previous um, graph, but, but the cost um, that would be associated with estimated costs that would be, um, and then what groupings of those six boxes that we described earlier, where do they fit into each of those six um, priorities? And so again, you can see um, some of the sort of sizing estimations that they were working on to determine uh, what kind of funding uh, options we may need to be looking at. So these are the 12 uh, service, uh, uh, service proposals that are advancing, uh, advanced to phase three. Um, and so in particular, as uh, John described, the, the most important box about adding people in the domain um, um, context areas, 
Um, we're looking to add 15 to 20 FTEs that are spanning across the libraries, the Office of Research, and OIT. Um, and then another one to three FTEs for research programming and support. Um, we're focusing on building, um, we're focusing on augmenting the people we already have in each of our organizations. So it's not a completely new set of skills and a, not a, a, a new set of uh, professionals, but it's really augmenting uh, the gaps um, and where the demand has been, uh, where we can measure the demand and see that this is um, an area we need to be focusing on. Um, and then more intentionally than we have in the past, we're going to be building cross-departmental virtual teams so that each of our three organizations now have a kind of a matrix um, relationship. Uh, we've all worked very well and collaboratively together, but this is going to be a little more formality uh, in the perspective. Um, I'm not going to go through each of the, these areas in particular, but you can, you can see that the list that John started out with, with the, of the kind of high-level areas, uh, have been more specifically identified into, into very um, specific um, priorities we're going to be focusing on. Then we regrouped these um, priorities again into, into three different areas. And so um, one was focusing on better, supporting, better support for researchers by adding personnel, uh, improving coordination. Um, the, other category, the second category would be enhancing computational services and building capacity for data intensive resources. And the third being balancing security and compliance requirements and the flexibility needed to support different types of research. And so we've broken those six boxes into these three high priority areas uh, and allows us to, to think about the ways that our virtual teams will interact together um, to meet um, those priorities. So the phase three perspective, uh, or phase three of this pro uh, process was determining the structures of how to implement it. And this is where the co-sponsors, again, Tracy and Joe and Jenny, um, added some additional um, participants and partners. So they convened a planning team with the financial leads on campus. This would be the executive vice president for finance, the provost, um, the dean of the School of Medicine, the dean of Trinity um, College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and they began, uh, and then, and, and financial uh, experts in each of our areas um, to begin to uh, work on uh, what kind of um, ongoing funding options we might have for each of those priority services. Do we charge grants um, directly? Do we need to uh, consider what our indirect uh, calculations are? Um, can we do philanthropy uh, fundraising for this? Can we, um, do we need to be thinking about how to pitch um, another allocation funded um, proposal to the dean so that they share some of their allocations or consider what cost sharing would be across the different schools. Um, they developed a multi-year funding and walk-up plan, uh, which included, as, if needed, or as needed, bridge funding uh, for various pieces, because we weren't entirely sure how quickly we might need to, to ramp up some of this or how long we could push off uh, and delay some of these implementations. And then finally, we wanted to be sure that any of the planning we did would have uh, the sponsor backup uh, backing so that um, the sponsors would be um, able to continue to implement um, these in each of the three organizations. So they developed a five-year pro forma that the co-sponsors and the co-funders um, agreed upon and, um, and we believed that they were going to be supportive of each of those categories. So the categories were in research support, the storage services, the service navigation, um, the IT services and infrastructure, and then security and compliance. And the provost and uh, the executive vice president for finance identified that they could come up with a, a, an initial investment of a million and a half dollars um, as the potential to increase over, uh, over $5 million over five years. And then we've also begun to explore uh, philanthropic strategies with Duke Development as we're um, currently in you know, planning for a future um, capital campaign. So these are some of the types of positions that we're able to um, prioritize um, in the next, uh, next phase. So in the Office of Research, they'll be focusing on uh, data security and research data nav navigators. In the libraries, we're going to be increasing and emboldening our research data management program, um, including um, adding more capacity for data visualization consult consultations um, and uh, data licensing uh, for the data sets that our faculty are needing to acquire. Um, continuing again with the strategy on metadata, being metadata make, uh, being core um, to how we do long-term preservation and, and access. Um, and then also thinking about how to expand in our digital humanities and GIS um, uh, specialties. And obviously the, the list that you see in OIT if, are ones you would expect. Um, we need additional technical personnel, uh, website consultation, um, software development, business analysts. Um, there's a lot more client support and security analysts that we need to be thinking about given the demand that's, that's rising. And then the domain expertise, um, focusing specifically in the areas um, that the, each of the faculty um, groups identified as being uh, critical for their, for their domains. 
And then the types of services that we're going to be implementing, you know, uh, increasing our cloud infrastructure and storage to connect active and published research. Um, what is that bridge that we need to be building um, between where the, where the uh, research has been ongoing and where we need to be thinking about uh, long term? Um, building protective enclaves for our research data, again, in different contexts, because not everybody needs the same types of protections for the data they're using, but how can it be contextually appropriate? Um, collaboratively licensing strategies to enable that we're doing campus-wide and context-limited data sets. So the libraries have been doing uh, data licensing for some time that apply for the entire university, but when it doesn't apply university-wide, it's harder for us to do the licensing, and then faculty are kind of left out um, outside wondering how do they get the access to the data they need for their research. So thinking about different strategies for how to do that so we have the right organization doing the, the work. Um, Focusing on also semi-autonomous and reusable subclusters to support faculty startup packages. So instead of giving faculty specific packages that are just for them, how can we create our, our computing structure so that they are, it, it meets the needs of what they need for their startup, but whenever they're not using it or when they're moving on to different things, it can apply to another uh, faculty member and continue to be reusable and sustainable. Uh, and again, as John mentioned earlier, we, we all started this from the perspective of how do we enhance the Duke computing cluster that we were already pretty strong at. And I'll turn it on uh, over to Rebecca to talk about how we're doing implementation. So while, while John talked about 45 years, I get to do two months, so my job is a little bit easier. Um, so my name's Rebecca Brower. I'm the director of the Office of Research Initiatives, and I'm not sure if we're kind of a unique office, so I might take just a minute, because um, I'd love to hear if anybody else has something like this um, at their institution. But um, I basically employ um, people that have previously been faculty members or staff, so they've done their own research, or they've been the right-hand person for a researcher. And we try to make it easier for those, uh, the, the researchers that are at Duke. So whether that is sort of navigating them through the complexities of policies or um, you know, resources or figuring out how to do something. Um, that's one thing we do, but we also interface with other research support offices. So the contracting office, the IRBs and things like that. Um, I think I was telling John yesterday that I like to think that we wear uh, research support mullets. We're service up front and we're compliance and regulations in the back. So, so I'm gonna just talk a little bit about um, the, what we've been doing for the past couple of months and then also just looking ahead. So a lot of this has already been alluded to, so I'm gonna be brief. Um, we've went ahead and have established an implementation working group. So we have a leader in each of the three realms, OIT, the libraries and research, and we each brought a couple of others um, in, into, into, the, uh, into the working group. So in my case, I brought someone who was uh, well-versed in the data security elements as well as somebody in scientific integrity so that they can help us think about how we're gonna uh, implement these priorities. Um, we've been meeting together as a virtual team. I think there are about 12 to 14 of us that are, that are sort of leading the charge at this point. And we're doing a couple of things right now. Number one, trying to engage some of those school level resources. So these are gonna be largely IT resources. Um, also thinking about engaging the central units. So this is your contracting office, privacy, you know, IRBs, things like that. And we're also um, starting to re-engage faculty sponsors, and that's not up there, but we really need to make sure we have those faculty champions as we're thinking about implementation. So the things on our to-do list, and actually these are due Friday, um, if anyone is in the audience <laughs> that's working on a job description, we're prioritizing hiring. So we have, I think, seven um, jobs that we're gonna be hiring for in the spring. Um, we've prioritized it not just by writing the job descriptions, but we asked our sponsors to help us remove barriers to HR. I don't know what it's like at your institution, but having a job description doesn't mean that you're hiring the next day, it can be months. We said, we can't have that happen. Please help us remove those barriers. And so that's um, good. I think we think we'll have our job descriptions, our job, uh, jobs posted in January. Um, we're also connecting in with other service providers that may not have been included in phase one, two, and three. Um, so if, if you hadn't heard about this, um, this whole initiative at Duke, you, you know about it now because we're making it a priority. Um, the working group, um, we actually have a subgroup of the working group that's looking specifically at metrics. So one of the things we want to make sure we're clear on is what, do, what does success mean? And we are going to be you know, talking with our faculty ambassadors about that. What does it mean? And then we can start to um, map out the milestones, um, understand whether we are meeting demand, you know, are we at capacity, just really make sure that we're tracking everything so that as we um, go through the, the months and years on this, we, you know, we see are we, do we have the staffing we need and the resourcing we need to meet the priorities as we had um, described them. 
Um, and then finally, especially with us being, I mean, we are, we have worked together. I mean, this is not entirely new, but we've never worked together with these very specific priorities in mind. So we know that we're going to have to add some um, governance uh, to, to this uh, whole model. So um, I think that, uh, Tim obviously was talking a bit about this, um, how we have the 12 services that have been um, defined, the 12 priority areas. Um, when we were in phase one, frankly, when we started to hear what the pain points were, I have to say, on some things, we just got going. We, we knew it was a no-brainer. We had to get moving on some of these. I'm not going to read all of them. I'll tell you, I think one that's really important um, in the top center there is um, we're working on our protected enclave. And I think this speaks to um, number one, uh, it, it actually has a little bit to do with um, security and compliance, but also just making it easier. Um, our, our protected enclave at Duke um, previously was very, very onerous, a lot of barriers to getting in, and we said we can do better. So we are actually in the midst of developing a two-tier um, protected enclave that has very tight security controls, um, but if you are dealing with, um, with regulated or protected data, you're gonna, we're going to layer administrative controls on top of that. We're actually we're in pilot right now, and we'll be launching in the spring. So I'm really excited about that. That's a huge advancement. Um, and then we have uh, several other offerings um, that are well on their way, um, including a, a self-service um, option. Um, John was talking about how hard it can be to find things. So we are working on a finder tool similar to what's available at Cornell. I'm not sure if you all are familiar with this, but you basically answer a couple of questions about your data classification, your compute needs, and your storage needs. And then you're offered up, here, here are the, the technical tools that might meet your needs. We're working on um, something very similar. And I think it'll be great when we have that available, not just to kind of find on your own, but to actually infuse that into part of process at Duke. So when we know someone will be at that point where they're needing a technical tool, let's, let's slip this finder um, under their nose. So uh, next steps. So um, we, I already mentioned that we're, you know, we're doing our hiring. That's exciting. Um, the other thing we're doing is, you know, we have these 12 priorities, but we have, when we started meeting as an implementation team, we realized we were already putting the, you know, in, in the libraries, you were already putting the pedal down on this area and OIT was doing this. We're looking at our, our existing sort of um, sequencing of, of the priorities and figuring out how we're going to all work together. Um, especially in some areas where we have a lot of overlap. I know that um, Tim and I are working on a data licensing service, and you know we're going to have to just pr figure out where this is all going to lie in sequence. So that's been a big, um, it's going to be a big thing over the next several months. And then also just learning how to work as a virtual team. Um, I think uh, we are uh, one thing. I I, we haven't mentioned, but we, we recognized when we were meeting um, that we all had day jobs already. Um, and so we thought, you know, it's great, we're going to carry these out, but there's no way that we could put this on top of our, um, on our existing roles. So we are going to be hiring probably a person that's going to be serving as kind of an administrative director or program manager. That's this is going to be their entire job is to drive this forward, pull us together when needed, and, and really um, just continue to drive forward the priorities. So the takeaways. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing some of the things that we've said today are not going to be um, surprises for you. Um, John also mentioned this may feel particularly unsurprising if you are coming from an academic medical center where there can be additional pain points and barriers there. Um, so I, th I think that um, I, I'd be curious to hear you know, if, if you all um, have the same experience that we've had in terms of what you heard from your faculty. Um, but another big takeaway, and this is if you're planning to do this at your own institution, um, there were three things that were key, right? Getting that um, really, really sincere faculty input every step of the way, um, I think, is, is absolutely critical. Um, the leadership engagement, um, our leaders are very curious, um, and so they're asking us questions. They are holding us accountable. I mean, this is a huge priority for them, and without this, this, this never could have happened. Um, because there was pressure, um, I will say, to, to, to make it work, and there is, um, yeah, an ongoing uh, requirement for, um, for this to be a priority for all of the, the groups. Um, and then the other thing that I, I know is um, near and dear to my heart, because I feel sometimes those of us that are required to implement things get left out and you're handed um, a steaming pile of garbage that you have to go do. And you said, I didn't get to weigh in on whether this was going to be feasible. And I think all of us were engaged early on so we could really start to think, you know, how could we actually, you know, make this work? So having all three, really important, frankly, at every single stage. 
Um, and then the other takeaway, in case it's not implied, this is, um, it is time consuming, but I think it's extremely, um, hopefully very beneficial for the researchers. So we're looking forward, the next um, 18 months are gonna be um, where we really focus on, I think, um, understanding uh, you know, our metrics and how things are going, and then we'll be making decisions every single year to uh, continue the staffing and to continue the investments. So I think with that, we're gonna leave some time um, for questions. Hello, uh, Zhi Wuxie from uh, University of California, Riverside. Uh, this is really a, a, a solid and, and really inspiring piece of work. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, well, your top priority over there, 15, 20 FTEs, really doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, I've been working many years with researchers. Uh, while we've been working with computational social scientists, computational biologists, computational whatever it is after that, uh, your work would make their life a lot easier. Uh, but on the other hand, I would like to have a, uh, uh, I wonder if you consider there are lots of biologists, psychologists, uh, social scientists who does not have that computational thing uh, in front of them. Uh, and they have large data sets, they have a research question. And who can answer those questions? So I wonder if you, any of your uh, 15 to 20 FTEs would be uh, taking that type of work. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I think so. We also know that we can write all the job descriptions we want. The number of people uh, who, you know, who, who can do the, 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 the job of being Superman and Batman simultaneously is limited and, and will work for what a university can pay them. So we've also put a lot of thought into the ecosystem of developing people who can do this. So we expect, especially in some of the disciplines you just named, to leverage in a formal way PhD students and others through fellowships and other opportunities to create some aggregate FTE out of the young domain experts in the field who have grown up with the technology. Even undergraduates can be a huge asset to a senior faculty member in a, in a humanities department to navigate how to use, uh, in the grand scheme of things, not terribly complicated technology, but it's complicated to the faculty member. Uh, so. Um, we have worried from day one about where this domain expertise actually exists and, and expect it to be really the gamut of full-time people down to post, you know, postdoctoral and graduate student fellows and even undergraduate fellows helping us to deliver this ecosystem. Yeah, the, the, um, the majority of the staffing that are kind of coming to the libraries will be part of a center we created a few years ago called the Center for Data and Visualization Sciences. And their their mandate is to is to do that is to be that that baseline, foundational um, work you know giving consultation trainings workshops and again and to echo John's point we, we will train faculty when they are willing to come and and, and um, be trained but we all, we are primarily focused on graduate students and building up that skill set so that research assistants the graduate assistants can then support um, their faculty and and also have that career trajectory for themselves um, and have that skill base for themselves. Um, one of the, one organic thing that happened at Duke that isn't in this project, but is gonna be a benefit, it's gonna benefit from this project, but also will be a benefit to us is we created a, um, an intellectual center called the Center for Computational Thinking, which has also been examining not only how do we inject computational thinking into the different disciplines, but how do we create curriculum um, and co-curricular activities around it so that we can boost um, the holistic experience. And so I think that's another you know, that's another avenue we've, we're taking. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for your question. Hi, I'm David Millman from NYU. Uh, that was great. Thank you very much. Uh, we're in the middle of something similar to this, but um, so I'm looking forward to copying your slides down. But the. The, uh, the question is, um, and I think you, you may have said this, or if I took better notes, um, from start to finish, uh, I mean, you're, I'm, you're not going back 45 years, but when did you convene the first set of faculty? I think it was February of February 22. 2022. 2022. Yeah. And actually, I think if you look in the sketch, um, we actually have um, links to the full reports, both of phase one and phase two, so I know for sure um, some of the details are in there. Great, thank you, that yeah. was great.
Good afternoon. David Drysback from Florida International University. This is a great presentation. I'm curious, as you assess like, your entire IT infrastructure of people um, and your, where you are now, how much um, progress do you think you can make with the existing IT folks to develop them to support researchers just in general, like in, as it relates to training and so forth, um, as you develop the community? Yeah, we, we've already done a pretty, well, it, I mean, it depends on the discipline. We, we, we already have quite a number of our IT staff who are very comfortable working directly with faculty in the kind of tr traditional HPC space, because you know, the faculty who are in that space tend to be kind of geeky themselves, and so they're able to, to, uh, to, you know, to, to talk, to communicate with the bit breathers we keep in the basement who understand how to optimize the networks. <laughs> Um, but we can't let them out, you know, to the to the humanities faculty. Uh, so this is, um, you know, so so growing. My in my hat is research under research computing. We are, you know, trying to grow the team of people that are really good and come and at going out and talking to faculty from all disciplines and translating their needs into the services they have. It is a rare skill set to find someone, you know, who's versed technically. Uh, enough to understand our services under the cover and can you know disarm a faculty member into speaking candidly about what what they're really trying to do rather than I think I need a, this cloud service today. Well, what what's what's the actual workflow? And we have a few people like that. I'm not sure Katie is scalable in her current yeah. form, mm -hmm. so we need to replicate that person a few times over. Uh, but we've at least seen demonstration proofs that we can do that. And in, independent of this initiative, we'd already has. There had already been some campus-wide um, organizational um, assessment of where do IT um, staff need to be, and and you know we all, as John said, we have a distributed campus, but we also created some more centralization opportunities. So the Trinity College of Arts and Sciences, for example, merged a, a big chunk of their IT staff into central IT because they weren't really college-based, um, and what was retained were the were the context-specific um, technical staff that really needed to work with faculty. And it gave you know the the other um, the, the more solid you know foundational IT staff an opportunity to be in a larger grouping, a larger network that helped that distri distribution be more possible. And the libraries, of course, are kind of are similar in that as well. We merged a little bit of our of our organization so we could be focused on the specialties that the libraries can deliver um, more specifically. Hi, Jill Sexton, NC State University. I was wondering. Well, first, uh, congratulations. I'm I'm really. Um, thrilled to see you get this kind of buy-in, especially since you're a kind of neighbor of ours, and I um, hope to be able to leverage your reports uh, on my own campus. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about um, the cost and how you raise the money to, so I'm assuming these are new positions, not repurposed positions, and um, any advice you can give us to making the argument that this is a worthwhile investment, I think we would all benefit from. And I think that I think some risk went into the process when our provost changed halfway through because we knew our old provost yeah. by, bought into this, and I think there was some nervousness. Yeah. Um, but uh, our new provost um, um, immediately bought into this idea as well and viewed it as critically important, as did our AVP. I mean, one of the most remarkable things about this is we, we are writing job descriptions now and starting the hiring process before we actually know where all these people are going to live, because we got the marching orders from the most senior leadership, you've convinced us this is critical to the university. And we know we, we, can, we might be arguing for months over some of the details of who lives where, but go ahead and hire them. <laughs> it's too risky not to proceed with the hiring. So go ahead and do that and trust that the process will eventually home them in a sensible place. Um, but it, I mean, it's because we had you know, the buy-in from senior leadership, more, you know, more or less from day one, that this was a critical thing to do. That, that I mean, Tracy wasn't going to waste our time if there wasn't a chance of, of it actually having effect. Yeah, specifically to where the funding is coming from. Um, so the initial wave of funding is coming from existing resources, so strategic funds that were identified as, um, and so you can imagine that they're, they're predominantly one-time or at least opportunities for one-time injection that we'll be able to walk on in the not-so-distant not future. Um, the other model they're looking at is what kind of um, like grant tax can we apply. So we're actually going to we're looking at a, stealing an idea from UNC Chapel Hill, which had applied a, a tax for to stir up their data science um, um, program. So uh, we're looking at that and what will the calculation be and how much can we raise. Again, that's one that they want to make sure that will um, pass uh, muster with the federal funding agencies that we can actually apply that 
Um, and then the third aspect is um, strategies and philanthropy. And so what we've been um, discussing with the Central Development Organization is, um, again, starting with the faculty. So having faculty ambassadors write their impact statements about what the impact is um, to their research um, is uh, making sure that when we make uh, you know big requests from donors that we apply, I don't know, a, a five, 10%, 15% mm -hmm. sort of addition to that request to say this is what is needed to support the research and sustain the research that's going. So, you know, uh, our Dean of uh, Trinity talked about being in a living room where um, getting ready to pitch a, um, a big research uh, equipment need that in, in a particular area where this family has a history of, um, you know, been wanting to, to be a contributor to and said to them, you know, we can, this is great, this gift will go and buy this piece of equipment, but we still need that, those people to run the equipment and to sustain the equipment, and so it's gonna need another 10%, you know, gift for that, and, and that donor understood that, and, and so it was, you know, and that, that kind of compelling case is what we're also gonna be working on. Well, one of the keys of keeping the faculty coming to these IT advisory committee meetings for 25 years is we always guaranteed to end on time. Um, <laughs> So we will end on oh, time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention.